Before we go much further, let's discuss some notation. Let y be a continuous random variable describing a value of interest. For example, the height of adult males or the time it takes for a postal carrier to complete her route. Random variable y naturally has a distribution. And that distribution, which describes the population of the phenomenon described by the random variable, has a population mean, mu. We usually don't know much about this population. We know that it exists, and we know that mu exists, but we don't know what the shape of the distribution looks like or what its parameters are. All we can do is collect a sample from the population and do our best to estimate the population parameter of interest, mean mu. We collect a sample of size n consisting of realizations of y, y1 through yn, and calculate the mean of the sample, y bar, which is the sum of the observations of y sub i for i equals 1 to n, and divide by n. We are interested in an estimate of the population parameter mu, and our best estimator for mu is the sample statistic y bar. Note the difference, population parameter and sample statistic. When we're talking about means, the population mean mu is the population parameter, and sample mean y bar is the sample statistic. The branch of statistics that lets us take a sample from a population and draw inferences about the population is called inferential statistics. The assignment of values to a population parameter based on a value of a corresponding sample statistic is called estimation. The sample statistic used to estimate a population parameter is called an estimator. Our estimator from mu is y bar. The same is true for other population parameters and sample statistics. Sample variance S mm -hmm. squared is the estimator for population variance sigma squared. And likewise, the standard deviation S from the sample is the estimator of population standard deviation sigma. And if we're interested in learning more about the proportion of a population that falls into one of two categories, for example, the proportion that will vote yes on a particular ballot initiative, or the proportion of defective corn ballers produced in the US, we use the proportion found in a sample, p hat, as an estimator of the population proportion, p. So why do we estimate in the first place? It's generally too difficult, too time consuming, and too expensive to find all members of the population and collect the realization of our random variable for every member of that population. Consider the US Census, which collects realizations of several discrete random variables, for example, household size, and continuous random variables, for example, household income, along with several qualitative variables. But the US Census Bureau doesn't collect information from every single person or household. Some aren't known, some move during the process, some don't respond at all. It's simply too difficult to collect information from everybody. The census contacts a sample of the population to collect information, and tools of statistical inference are used to draw conclusions about the larger population. Another example, from an engineering perspective, deals with acceptance sampling. In some industrial settings, we may accept a batch of input components from a supplier by inspecting a few random components in the batch, making sure that the components in that sample meet specifications, then drawing conclusions about accepting the entire batch based on the sample. This saves time and resources that might otherwise be required to inspect every component in the batch. The estimation procedure has four straightforward steps. The first is to select a random and representative sample from the population of interest. Random suggests that any one member of the population is just as likely to be chosen to be in the sample as any other. Choosing a random sample hopefully eliminates any sort of bias that may affect our estimate. And representative suggests that members of the population generally look the same as the population we're trying to estimate. For example, if we're looking to learn about the views of people who watch the Golden mm -hmm. Girls, we probably shouldn't perform our study at a bar frequented mm -hmm. by college students. If you want to estimate the time required to perform a task for trained operators, don't include in your sample a new employee that hasn't fully gone through training. The second step in the estimation procedure is to collect information from the members of the sample. Namely, this means collecting the realizations of the random variable or variables of interest from the members of that sample. Say we want to estimate the mean height of students at a university. The population describes the students at, at the university, and the random variable that we're interested in is height of students. We choose a random and representative sample of those students, then we measure their individual heights. 
from an engineering perspective, we might want to learn more about the mean throughput per day of a particular production line. The sample would be a randomly collected set of days, and the re realizations we measure each day would be the day's throughput. The third step is to calculate the sample statistic of interest. For example, if we want to know the mean throughput each day, then we should calculate the mean throughput of our sample. And finally, in the fourth step, we now assign a value to the population parameter that we want to estimate based on our sample statistic. Our estimate of the overall mean throughput for all days is the value we found from our sample. And our estimate of the mean height of all students would be the sample mean of our representative sample of students. Another brief example to illustrate these four steps could involve designing a system around the characteristics of operators expected to use the system. Say we collect a random and representative sample of n equals 42 system operators, and then for each member of the sample, we measure their usable forward reach. Let's assume that our population parameter of interest isn't the mean reach of operators, but the proportion of those operators whose forward reach is fewer than 29 inches. That is, we want to estimate population proportion P. From our sample, we found that six of those 42 operators had a forward reach of fewer than 29 inches. So sample proportion P hat is 6 divided by 42, or 0.143. Therefore, based on our sample, our estimate of the population proportion P of all system operators whose reach is fewer than 29 inches would be 0.143. Or, 14.3% of operators have a reach fewer than 29 inches. However, the value of a sample statistic that is used to estimate a population parameter is just a point estimate. We know that it's highly dependent upon the sample, highly dependent upon the size n of the sample. Naturally, the larger the n, the better we feel about the conclusions we can draw about the population. And highly dependent upon the variability within the sample. High variability in the sample might mean that the population is highly variable and might mean that our sample may not really represent the population. We take everything that we know about the sample, both good and bad, and reduce it to one number. Then we estimate the larger population based on that number. We can do better than this. We counter this point estimate problem with an interval. We state that this interval is likely to contain the corresponding population parameter. Back to our throughput example. Say our lower bound on the interval is A, and the upper bound is B. We believe that the true proportion lies somewhere, though not entirely sure where, inside the interval between A and B. We call these intervals confidence intervals, as we have some amount of confidence that the true population parameter lies on the interval. For example, we say we're 95% confident that the population mean throughput lies between A and B based on our sample. The wider the interval, the more confidence we have that the population parameter lies in the interval. So how do we find this interval? A natural starting place is our point estimate. We then add to the point estimate and subtract from it a value called the margin of error to estimate the interval. That is, the point estimate plus and minus a margin of error. If we're looking to find an interval for the population mean, then the interval is calculated with y bar plus and minus the margin of error. What size should the margin of error be? Three primary elements make up the margin of error. Variability, sample size, and confidence. Naturally, you can imagine that if the population is highly variable, that is, has a large standard deviation, then if our sample is representative, the sample should be highly variable as well. The larger the variability in the sample, the more difficulty we have in pinpointing an estimate for the population parameter we're interested in. As such, variability affects the size of the margin of error. The larger the variability, the larger the margin of error needs to be for us to have faith that our population parameter lies between bounds A and B. The effect of variability and sample size are related. Recalling from our discussion of sampling distributions that our estimator of population variance is a function of sample size. For example, the variance of the sampling distribution for sample means is sigma square over n. As such, sample size also affects the size of the margin of error. The larger the sample size, the smaller the margin of error needs to be for us to have faith that our population parameter lies between bounds A and B. This should make intuitive sense as well. The more we witness a phenomenon, 
the better we might feel about estimating, for example, the mean performance of that phenomenon. The less you observe a phenomenon, that is, the smaller the sample size in, the less faith you have in your ability to estimate what will happen. Finally, the last element of the margin of error is a measure of the confidence we have that the population parameter lies in our interval. Confidence is a term that is used regularly in inferential statistics, and it refers to the probability that the interval calculated from a sample will contain the population parameter. Typical confidence amounts are 90%, 95%, and 99%, with 95% being the most common. Again, a 95% confidence interval suggests that if an experiment is repeated 100 times, same sampling approach, same sample size, 95 of the resulting 100 intervals calculated will contain the population parameter of interest, just based on sampling. In fact, that's why we refer to these intervals as confidence intervals. Why not a 100% confidence interval? The interval would be too wide as to be unusable. For example, I'm 100% confident that the sun will rise between midnight and noon. With that wide of a confidence interval, I essentially provide no useful information. How is confidence calculated? The typical notation for a confidence interval is a 1 minus alpha times 100% confidence interval. For example, for a 95% confidence interval, alpha equals 0.05. The value of alpha is often referred to as the significance level. In this case, 95% confidence, or 0.05 significance. As such, we want to choose a margin of error such that 95% of repeated experiments will provide us with confidence intervals that contain the population parameter. As we're dealing with a percentage, or a probability, you might imagine that we could relate this margin of error to a value on the probability distribution. For the case of creating an interval for a population mean, we use the standard normal, or Z, distribution to derive this confidence. In this case, the values of plus and minus z on the z-axis correspond to a 1 minus alpha times 100% confidence interval. Note in the distribution that 1 minus alpha times 100% of the realizations of z lie between negative z and positive z. This concludes our introduction to statistical intervals. We'll bring these concepts to life with a discussion of specific confidence intervals for a population mean, population proportion, and population variance, and we'll apply these intervals to estimate population parameters in several engineering contexts.